Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Kristen Snowden. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist in the state of California, but this isn't therapy. Um, this is just a live webinar and then a taped video to kind of help you navigate the most extreme and painful relationship crises that, that tend to come up. So it's not just for um, those who are struggling with sex addiction, which is often um, why people come into the sexandrelationshiphealing.com um, webinars, but it's also for people who are trying to navigate infidelity in general um, and other kind of emotional, physical abuse stuff that, that comes up in a relationship that triggers a lot of pain and confusion. Um, so one of the most commonly hit topics on my um, site is always on betrayal trauma. And um, those are some of my highest viewed videos. So I thought I'd spend a little bit more time on that subject because I think we've worked so hard um, in our community to try to get the word out that betrayal trauma is real. So often we'll say in the community in, in treatment and recovery that your partner's more likely to leave you for the lies that you tell, the manipulation that you engage in, the gaslighting that occurs um, rather than the, you know, the events that you engage in, the behaviors you choose. Because that piece, while the other piece is also very traumatizing and hurtful, the betrayal trauma of someone who is supposed to be a trusted loved one, someone who's supposed to be putting you and your relationship and your family's safety and interest as a priority, um, suddenly shows you through an uncovered addiction, whether it's sex addiction or gambling, where they're hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt, to drug and alcohol addiction, where they've maybe been emotionally absent, physically abusive, emotionally abusive, um, uncovering that I thought I knew this person and really they've had this whole double life outside of what I thought our life was. You know, if, if that, A, there, there's severe trauma that occurs and I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on that, but I've also done several videos kind of explaining what betrayal trauma is, the symptoms of it. So I'm gonna encourage you to get more details from that. Um, but it's also just kind of think, realizing that if, that wasn't real, you know, from all the lies and manipulation, what was real? And it really causes people to completely break down and lose everything, not just their, their safety in a marriage, but safety in just confidence in their basic decision-making, uh, confidence in well, who am I then? You know, what am I? What is this marriage? You know, if, if, if I've been married to this person who's capable of lying and bamboozling me, then maybe everything's been a lie. You know, if, if his or her addictions run the past three years, but we've been married for the past 10 years, I'm gonna question the entire 10 years. I'm gonna question all of my relationships because clearly I have bad decision-making. You know, these are all common shaming voices that come upon us when we uncover the very devastating um, reality that our partner has been living a double life beyond us. Um, and another element besides like sex addiction and, and other addictions and infidelities, which cause betrayal trauma, I find that it also exists in any kind of relationship where there's kind of been a highly manipulative person in the relationship. Maybe they didn't engage in infidelity, but they're constantly regularly gaslighting you because they're invested in always being right and you always being wrong and them always staying up here because they don't have the ego strength. They're too fragile emotionally to ever own that they're like, you know, they're just a flawed human being. So let's say that, that, that maybe there's not infidelity, but that person tends to have narcissistic traits, let's say. So that also occur, occurs there. So that's applicable to people as well. So today's focus is going to be not defining what betrayal trauma is, because I think many webinars have defined that, and I hope you all understand that, but talking in detail about what the evidence-based um, treatment options are for clients to get dig their way out of kind of the physiological, emotional, and spiritual consequences of being betrayed. 
So the book that I always like to hang on and reference a book when we're, I'm doing my webinar, so you guys can always go back and do, obviously anyone who's chiming in here is great at doing their independent study work. So you're great about looking things up online. This is bar none, one of the best trauma educational books for the layman's person, right? So someone who's not a neurological scientist who just wants to kind of understand what the heck is going on in my body and why do I feel so out of control? Like none of this stuff is in my realm of control. Um, the Body Keeps Score is really great because you can apply all um, the concepts to, to the most recent crisis. He, he does get a lot into um, ACEs, like the adverse childhood experiences and stuff, but I want you to hear that there are lots of people out there who are betrayed partners who do not have like extreme obvious trauma in their childhood. You know, s several things just happen upon the road in their marriage and relationship. One thing led to another, and now they suddenly find themselves in deep levels of betrayal. So don't read from this book that if I find myself in the state of a betrayed partner, then that must mean I had this deeply traumatizing childhood. Um, one doesn't necessarily connect with the other. But one thing I find that rings true to both um, scenarios is the, the trauma consequences that happen in the brain. So basically, when you uncover the trauma of finding out that your partner's been lying, that there's been some addiction going on, that there's been infidelity, that all the things that the person's been saying and doing is a big lie, there's gaslighting. So gaslighting is when someone is highly invested and highly manipulative and trying to tell you that what your reality is, is not your reality. So a really common example is, no, I'm not having an affair. Stop asking me why I'm getting these blocked phone calls. Um, it's for work because I'm working really hard to pay the bills. And how dare you not be grateful of the fact that I'm working my butt off to support this family. And no, I don't want to have sex with you because you're a nag like this. That's a common story. But the truth is, is the block calls are his affair partner and he's having an affair. So meaning you had these instincts and intuition telling you that something's going on and they regularly are saying, uh, no, this is the new reality I want you to adopt. Um, so anyway, the state of what happens in your brain when you are traumatized is you are triggered. It's, it's as if I kind of basically like stabbed you, the same part comes out. It's as if I just put a giant grizzly bear in front of you and said, okay, um, find your way out of the house. You and the grizzly bear are stuck in the house. It lights up everything in that back part of your brain, that fight, flight, or freeze that is saying your life is in danger. You are being threatened. And, and guess what? When that's on fire, when that's highly deeply aroused, as you continue to uncover more and you continue to question more and you continue to feel so unsafe as you figure out, am I staying with this person? Am I leaving? Um, is he leaving? Is she leaving? How much money was involved? Oh my gosh, our lives are in ruin. Our retirement's gone. Um, as you continue to uncover that, you stay back there in that involuntary part of your brain, which is that fight, flutter, freeze, trying to, your brain's working overtime trying to make sure that it stays alive you know it thinks it's keeping you alive but unfortunately what's also happening is your brain can't operate in two areas and so your prefrontal cortex or the neocortex um, which is like your rational thought which helps regulate and kind of tell the back of that brain it's okay you know it's going to be okay and this is how you're going to figure it out and resourcing and decision making um, and, and calming down a reaction to something, so an emotional reaction, that cannot be on because it is too busy back here. So then the secondary consequence is always this shame of, um, like I feel like my emotions are out of control. And that there's in a, in a moment of crisis, there's so many um, important quest uh, questions that have to be answered, so many important decisions that have to be made. And you can't even pay attention to the information coming into you and you have almost no memories. I mean, the common thing is clients years later, they'll look at pictures and be like, I don't even remember that vacation. I don't even remember that holiday. Where, where was I? What's the story? You know, I was just talking to another client who was saying that I, I can't remember people's names. I can't hold on to anything. And so again, in this time where it is the most 
crisis intensive where the decision making is so life altering and you find yourself stunted, there can be just so much additional shame on top of it. The other thing about the emotional dysregulation is when you go, like, let's say you uncover that your partner has been having an affair. And so you go into couples counseling, right? To an untrained clinician and you walk in and your partner's already, you know, I've done a, I have an article that's pretty popular. It's called the myths and realities of divorce after betrayal. And it's kind of um, how uh, the partner who's already been cheating and lying and kind of covering it up, minimizing it for sure, the damage, um, they certainly often come into couples therapy in a much more calm state, um, you know, because they've been invested in putting up the defenses, being completely disconnected from their body and feelings because they just are acting without thinking. The betrayed partner is the one who's coming in with high emotional reactivity, high dysregulation, because again, they're in that fight. I mean, the bear is running after them. So to an untrained clinician, to just the average marriage or couples therapist who does not understand betrayal trauma might make that betrayed partner the identified patient, right? Because they'll, they'll look and not understand the concepts of gaslighting and manipulation and no have a framework or a reference point of going, gosh, could you imagine how traumatizing it'd be? You have three kids and you unravel that, you know, your partner's leaving you for the secretary and you don't know what your finances are. You've been a stay at home mom. And understanding of someone lying to your face and the trauma of all that that happens and not having that filter of understanding what betrayal trauma looks like and having the right uh, assessment and questions to ask those people might erroneously skip over to like, okay, let's talk about healthy communication and let's talk about the relationship dynamics and let's talk about these kind of general marital um, techniques and treatment that um, that we're all taught to do in our master's program. Um, those could just be more damaging in the immediate uh, kind of months of, of uncovering, unfolding, unraveling. So I definitely encourage anyone, and I always say this to anyone who emails me and asks me questions, please find a therapist who understands the concepts of relational trauma, betrayal trauma, we call it lots of different things. Um, who has, I send often people to sex, certified sex addiction therapists, even if there's just a single infidelity or some porn use uncovery or some addiction issue that you don't feel like requires a sex addiction therapist. But I always say, look, they're the ones who understand these concepts. And so they are not kind of going to be confused or distracted by the fact that you're strongly emotionally dysregulated, that you have really strong emotional reactions, and then your partner's just like, yeah, I wish uh, he or she'd had sex with me more, or complimented me more, or you know, he or she's just mad that I work too much. Um, they are just more uh, deeply and intensely trained to understand the entire framework of what's going on. Okay, so with that said, let's dive into the actual healing components. So your mind, body, and spirit have completely been annihilated by uncovering these betrayals. Um, so there, there's oftentimes an extreme disconnection from your brain and your body. They even call it like alexithymia is the idea of like, you just know you're deeply confused or in pain or miserable, um, but you can't put words, you can't understand you can't connect the two there's there's a lack of language there to be able to come into like treatment and and properly kind of explain what's really going on and obviously if if you can't explain what's going on and you can't um put a language to all that it's going to be really really hard to treat that um and also it's a it's something important to say before we talk about the healing um options right we can never undo what happens, right? That's never the goal of trauma treatment. Unfortunately, these are things that are going to be part of your life story forever. We hope that it's not, the trauma and the crisis is not what defines you, defines your marriage. And we hope that we can just provide you the proper tools to kind of diffuse, you know, any kind of flashbacks, diffuse memories, 
um, and the reactions that happen to them. Help you reconnect with your body and reconnect with a full contextual story of understanding all the pieces and all the dynamics that are going on. And then also create some state of empowerment, you know, helping you reconnect with your intuition so you can identify warning signs, learn how to speak up, how to kind of fight for yourself, how to defend yourself, how to um, have shame resilience in that respect to, to show up and help to prevent it from happening again. Um, and maybe not necessarily being able to prevent it from happening again, but certainly feeling more resourced and more powered next time because this time you just were like blindsided and thrown on your back. So these are the most common things. And again, if you wanna learn in more detail, the body keeps score talk, but these are the kind of evidence-based, research-based approaches that he has used. Um, obviously he is a proponent of talk therapy. You must, you know, sharing your story lessens the isolation, the state of isolation. Um, and Sometimes, again, because you have like the alexithymia or you don't have the language for it, sometimes betrayed partners might benefit from working out of a workbook, like a more structured kind of thing where they're given very specific questions because it's like, hey, open-ended kind of process therapy, like how are you feeling? How are things going? Versus like, all right, let's write a boundaries plan. You know, what, what's okay, what's not okay? What's a safety plan? What do you need to feel safe? Um, how did you feel about this trauma? How did, you know, what was going on here? Sometimes having a more structured um, plan is, is more ideal because you're kind of just in a daze often. Um, obviously, one of the most important things is any kind of way that you've learned to down-regulate your emotional response. You are gonna experience almost everything, even a look from a person at school when you're walking through, dropping your kids off as a threat. And I'm not saying that in a um, criti criticism kind of way. It's kind of like a way of show yourself some grace and love. This is an involuntary part of your brain that's there to keep you alive. And it's just on fire because it's so confused about what is safe right now. And so any, so they use the box breathing is a really common evidence-based um, thing. So breathe in to count to three, hold it for a count of three, breathe out for a count of three, Breathe in for a count of three, hold it. So it's just this idea that you're reminding your brain, you're calming it down. Um, breathing in and out will alter your, your heart rate. And so that's kind of giving you the chance to, um, what I like to say is this takes very little oxygen and blood. Um, so it flares off without you know, any kind of uh, hesitation. This part takes a lot more oxygen and thought and blood. So you have to provide your body that extra oxygen to turn it on, bring in that impulse control, bring in that emotional re reactivity. One of my favorite grounding exercises um, that clients laugh at when I ask them to do it is um, count backward from 100 by seven. Cause you got to think about that one. And so what's that basically doing is it's not letting you worry about the grizzly bear that's running after you potentially. And you have to stop and turn on that prefrontal cortex to think, okay, 193 and onward and so forth. And so that turns on your prefrontal cortex. Other one is um, my, one of my favorite go-tos are naming boys and girls names um, with the, like particular letter. So name four boy, boys names with the letter T. Name three girls um, names with the letter R. And so again, it's just kind of turning on that prefrontal cortex, grounding you so you can move on to the next situation and assess, okay, how big is the threat right now? What are we really talking about here? Um, Bessel van der Kolk is a big fan of EMDR actually. Um, he does go into detail about how he feels like some EMDR um, certified therapists do it wrong or aren't properly trained. So it's actually really interesting to hear him talk about it. But um, he, um, I've had other people tell me that uh, EMDR is great for single traumas that you can kind of dive into single traumas versus complex trauma. So let's say your whole life you've gone from child abuse to um, stuff that happened in your teens. Now you're married to an addict and all that trauma. So um, EMDR might be great for a single infidelity or several very um, difficult traumas that you're trying to transcend through. I'm not so sure about complex over long periods of time trauma but it helps the client basically integrate everything instead of experiencing them kind of in flashes of loud sound, scary moment, 
he said this, she said that, I drove by that restaurant and that's where that happened. It helps you integrate everything. So you can kind of, um, I don't know, make sense of it all. Uh, instead of it kind of pieces of the feelings and memories and sensations happening at you and triggering your physiology, it helps you put it all together into kind of one coherent um, integrated experience so you can make, make sense of it all and your brain likes that your brain likes things to be put in a bento box um, it's important to note that when you start doing emdr eye movement desensitization and reprocessing um, your it's extremely uncomfortable because there is some trauma event exposure so um, just know that but studies show um, that if you stick with it um, at first, it's extremely uncomfortable. Your heart rate goes up, your blood pressure goes up. You are not comfortable, but over the course of several sessions, um, your stress hormones go down, your heart rate goes down, et cetera. I will say this, look, EMDR, this is something really important because it's coming up with clients recently. EMDR therapists are trained to not do trauma exposure therapy or EMDR work with anyone who does not show the ability to properly downregulate and kind of resource to get back to that safe place because they would be held liable if, if they kind of cracked you open, exposed you to this trauma, and then sent you on your way knowing that you had no skills, that you already were on the cusp of feeling suicidal. Um, so you need to show evidence to your trauma therapist that you have some level of being able to do those downregulation skills, um, and a couple of these other things that I'm going to suggest to you to show that you will take responsibility for, for putting in the work to try to downregulate the fact that you are definitely going to get um, hyper aroused by this experience. Um, somatic experiencing, the idea behind that is that when we get stuck, there's, I've talked to you before about there's a cycle of trauma when you experience it. And um, when we get maybe immobilized or think our power is taken away or um, we get held down, we're helpless, we feel immobilized, we don't fully transcend the trauma experience into the recovery part where we kind of shake out the stress hormone and let it like move through us like other animal species tend to do when they're threatened. Somatic experiencing kind of goes back to those stuck points and helps you kind of get through them in a virtual sense, so to speak. Um, he also is a huge proponent of art, music, dance, movement. Those are ways of kind of getting into the um, flow of your brain and doing some healing um, with the flow and the synchronicity of dance, music, art. Uh, they do things to your brain. Um, and I've talked a little bit about that in my talks about like play and creativity and stuff like that. Neurofeedback's really interesting. He's a, he was a fan of that. Um, he says it helps a lot with attention deficit due to the crisis and trauma. So it's saying often you can't pay attention because you're constantly in that aroused state. Um, it helps with uh, traumatized, it helps increase your executive functioning from trauma because remember your, rash, your rational brain's turned off because you're hyper aroused. Um, and the, the person who was talking about it that he was uh, referencing was that they hope that neurofeedback basically intervenes in the circuitry of a trauma brain um, that promotes that constant state of like fear, shame, and rage, and instead kind of sends feedback to the brain to help the, the wiring of it to allow it to stabilize and increase resilience. So in those moments of stress, you kind of have a longer pause button that allows you to make the next best choice. He's a proponent, obviously, of, um, actually one of the things he talks most detailed about is yoga. He said that his initial um, studies on yoga and breath work related to yoga has shown um, phenomenal responses to actually like brain repair. So being able to, um, it can increase the act activation of the insula and the medial prefrontal cortex, which is basically um, that self-awareness part of your body that kind of reconnects with the rest of your body um, because the idea is, is how do you service a body that you're not even disconnected with? You know, how do you care for yourself when you're not even like connected with what's going on with it? And he's basically saying that yoga has shown really great promise in um, 
allowing people to, to stimulate the parts of their brain that allow that self-awareness and reconnect with their body. So I encourage clients all the time to try it out. Some people are like, nope, not going to do it. But I, I mean, studies are showing that's what it does. Writing, spending a lot of time to just freely write. And we're not talking caring about your grammar or your sentence structure. Write a letter, you know, how you're hurting, how scared you are. Write a letter to your partner that you're never going to send. Write a letter to your partner's affair partner that you're never going to send. The point is, is to kind of, again, like the art, music, dance, movement, get your brain into this like free flow state where it's kind of coming out. Um, and then internal family systems. He's a fan of internal family systems. If you want to read more of it, um, it's by, it's created by a guy named Stephen Schwartz. I read, I'm a little, I'm not um, trained in IFS at all. But what I could gather from it is it's this idea of internal family systems is saying there's internal parts of you, like a family of opposing needs and wants all the time. Um, so something that came up for me is it's this idea like you loved your, you love your partner. You have these memories and this life with this person. And part of you wants that. You don't want to lose your marriage, your family, um, you have good memories along with these huge, like, you know, traumatizing memories. And then, and, but sometimes there's this shame voice that doesn't want to acknowledge that, right? Because it's the same person that's harmed you and hurt you. Um, just one example is that all of these parts of your brain need to be acknowledged, need to be given a voice. Um, none of them are unreasonable or wrong. And to push them away is to just cause more harm. Um, lastly, there's uh, form healthy relationships connection with community and or animals. If people are too unbearable, if the vulnerability of relationships with other people are unbearable, that is why like wolf therapy, equine therapy, therapy with dogs, that is the purpose of it, is they are finding that you can start repairing those parts of your brains and be willing to be vulnerable um, with these animals in a way that's just as reparative as support groups. So I obviously always encourage support groups, always, always, but we're all perfectly imperfect beings and sometimes that can be um, difficult, but for sure the um, animal therapy is showing a great deal. Um, other side options are medication management, CBT, and um, DBT, dialectical behavioral therapy. And also he notes any kind of, for any basic trauma recovery, balanced eating and sleeping are also required. You know, any kind of working out, balanced eating, sleeping, those are just the kind of basic necessities to, to stay healthy and to move forward. And um, the big question to ask yourself too, as you're in, engaging in these trauma recovery processes is, is the threat still there? It's gonna be really, really difficult for you to heal your trauma brain and your emotional state if you are constantly finding more information out. If your partner is not engaged in a full, you know, full wholehearted effort at recovery, if you still question if the affair partner is lingering or it's gonna come back around, or you're still, gosh, I know so many people that are having um, had affairs with someone where they go to the same school and every day the woman has to walk on campus where that other woman is and they may be reconciling but that's like exposing yourself to the bear every day whether or not you want that person to have that much power over you that's involuntary that person is considered one of the most dangerous people in your life and you're walking past them every day that's going to be really really difficult for you to heal from. And so I'm just gonna really encourage you to explore with your um, therapist or professional, what do you need to be safe? What do you need to help your brain stop feeling threatened um, from your partner, from your environment, from your support system? That's, those are great questions to be asking yourself and establishing. And that's it. So how do you um, help them find that spot where they can still go, I'm going to count you know, backward from 100 by sevens, like, you, you, know, you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, what I, I can't obviously, I'm not sitting next to them in the car when they yeah. hear a song that makes them fall to pieces. Um, but what I just try to do is do repetition. So when I'm in session with them and I see that they're highly agita agitated, 
we'll do some of the grounding exercises because I want them to to remember them kind of it's drilling so that the idea is when you leave this office they're still there those options are still there like you have the power right because it's so disempowering to have these involuntary physiological consequences to this trauma and I, I want them to know that no you're still the boss of your body you just have to put way more work into it to kind of rekindle that connection again the you know, the thing that comes to mind, well, I spent a lot of my career trying to educate people on what trauma is. Um, because I think, again, I, I agree that I always use the term, ironically speaking, of criminal cases. Judge and jury would say, okay, dad beat me. Anyone, like everyone in the group agree that that's traumatizing? And everyone would raise their hand. Mm -hmm. And then I say, okay, well, dad um, was working full time, was a single father, and um, he would pick me up two hours late from school every day. Is that trauma? And everyone yeah. would be like, uh, uh, you know, because I think we feel more comfortable sinking our teeth into the tangible of, of a bruise, a cut, hitting, violence, things like that are just so obviously like that's not okay. The intangible of emotional abuse, of emotional neglect, of abandonment, rejection, shame, as you mentioned, those are internal and they're so intangible information, but thank you all for being here and uh, join the other opportunities. And Kristen, we'll see you in 2020. Happy holidays. Happy new year. <laughs>